Cronenworth on the move. Swag and a miss. Seawald shuts the door and the Diamondbacks win the series. Welcome to another Valley Sports Plug Arizona Diamondbacks recap for July 31st through August 13th, 2023. I'm Chris Patrick, and with me today, as always, my co-hosts Michael Benjamin and VSP Tallman here to break it all down for you. So let's go ahead and get right into it. In the last two weeks, the D-backs went 3-9 and nine over four series, and after this last weekend series, their overall record stood at 59-59, and even 500 for the season. Still in third place in the NL standings, and two and a half games back from a wild card spot. But let's go ahead and take a look at how it all went down for the Diamondbacks. Starting off the last two weeks, we would hit the road to take on the San Francisco Giants for a four-game series, and they would win just one of these games and lose the last three. After that, it was out to Minnesota to take on the Twins for a three-game series. They were swept out of town, losing all three of those. Now back at home at Chase Field, the D-backs would take on the dreaded Los Angeles Dodgers for just a two-game series. But despite a couple close games, they would lose both of these and be swept for the second straight series. The D-backs would stay at home to take on the San Diego Padres over the weekend. They dropped the first of the three-game series, but fought back and won the last two, possibly starting to build some momentum back, but we'll have to see. Now we'll pass it over to Michael Benjamin for a deeper look at the last two weeks. We start in the Bay Area with an 11th inning win behind a ground rule double from Cattell Marte and Scott McGuff's ninth save of the season. But the momentum didn't hold as the D-backs dropped the last three of the series. Unable to hold a three-run lead in game two, Logan Webb holds strong through seven in game three, and a sad display from the offense, leaving a solid showing from Brandon Fott to waste, lead to a gentleman's sweep from the second-place San Francisco Giants. We then head to Minnesota, and the slump set in in a bad way. Three solo homers and a disastrous bunt from Perdomo lead the Twins in Game 1. Ryan Nelson gets shelled through three innings in Game 2. And Paul Seawald drops his first save opportunity in Game 3 in truly amazing fashion, giving up the game-tying run on the first pitch and eventual game-winning homer to Matt Walner in the walk-off win for the Twins. It didn't get any easier as the NL West leading Los Angeles Dodgers come to town, Game one saw a solid effort from Julio Urias for the Dodgers, and a late game rally was just too little too late. And game two saw ex Diamondbacks great David Peralta lead the Dodgers to a victory with an eighth inning two run single. Only two games in this series, but technically it's another series losing sweep added to the resume. But we finish the recap with the San Diego Padres coming to Chase Field, nipping at the heels for third place. And Ryan Nelson is again torched in three innings in game one. But Zach Gallen comes back to form and Christian Walker bolsters the lead for a win in game two. And in game three, Lourdes Goriel Jr. saves the day with a pinch hit two run shot in the seventh. Paul Seawald secures his second straight save. And the Diamondbacks secure a direly needed series victory to stave off the Padres. Shut out twice only scoring over three runs three times, no more than five runs scored, but finally secure a series victory, the first in the past six series. Guys, the sad truth is a pennant is out of reach now as we've fallen 12 and a half games back of the Dodgers. But a wild card spot isn't out of the cards as the Diamondbacks are just two and a half games back. It's a far cry from where this team was sitting two months ago, but... The playoffs, honestly, are still salvageable. So I'll pass it over to Tallman so he can let us know what he's been seeing over the past two weeks. Just when we thought we were out, they pulled us back in, baby. All right, just kidding. A lot of room to grow here from a sense of saying that we're back in this. But getting a little bit of light shining on this team is great. Hearing about Tori getting fired up in the locker room after that Friday loss to the first game against the Padres and just – Finally winning our first series since almost a month. The last time they won a series was against the Braves back July 18th, 19th, 20. So what I'm really looking at here, and I say a little bit of light shining on them because this team is in a position to where maybe we can get 
the train back on the tracks because we're looking at a series against the Rockies. We got to go in there. We got to sweep some Rocky ass. Then we're going to go over back, play the Padres in San Diego, and we got to make sure we can steal another series from them. And really, I think we're in a prime position to do that. The losing streak is over. I thought it would never end. But hey, guys, we're on a two-game winning streak right now. When a week ago, I thought we were never going to win another game. Some positives I saw, Zach Allen going out there on Saturday, throwing a great game. We're finally able to pull off a W and a Zach Allen start, which it seemed like it was forever since that happened last. And we also got the W on the 25th anniversary game on Saturday for the Diamondbacks. So that was a good way for all the fans that were out there. I'm sure it was absolutely slammed out there. They're giving away that free jersey. They had all the past D-backs legends out there, so I'm sure it was a great time, and then we got to leave with the W. Looking at this, even Brandon fought. I mean, he started off shaky in his last start. In the first inning, he gave up the three runs, but he really actually got dialed in. That was promising to see. We got Merrill Kelly coming up here in our first game against the Rockies. He did leave his last start with an injury. He left a little early, but sounds like he's doing good, and Man, he was pitching great in that last start. So we really need him to come out, be solid. Because right now, if you guys think about, we have a hole in our pitching rotation right now. With them sending down Ryan Nelson, we got Gallon, Kelly, Fott, Slade, Ciccone. I mean, what's going to go on here? So really, we're going to be seeing some bullpen games in our future. Also, staying aggressive with this roster. I love this front office of being so aggressive with that roster. Obviously, what we had going on the last month, month and a half is not working. So they're switching it up to see if we can figure this out. So, like I said, a little bit of light being shined back on this team. Let's see what we can do with it. So you're saying there's a chance. I think I agree with Michael Benjamin. The pennant might be out of the question right now, but a wild card is perfectly within reach. Like we were saying, two and a half games back. I do like the aggressiveness from the front office, Tom, and you're right. The ability to shift and position, send guys up, give guys a chance. It shows that they're still trying to stay aggressive and figure out what the winning formula is going to be. But honestly, it's the same shirt, different day. It's the pitching staff that is becoming a major detriment to this team. And yeah, the bats have gone a little bit cold. And personally, I'm wondering if Corbin Carroll is hitting a bit of a wall here in his rookie year. In the last two weeks, he's batting just 182 average with eight hits, two RBIs, and zero home runs. Very uncharacteristic from what we were seeing from him early in the season. Some other guys that are struggling, Alec Thomas, 174 average in the last two weeks, four hits, one home run, and three RBIs. Granted, just 11 games of the 13. But then another guy, Cattell Marte, batting 156 average with seven hits, two home runs, and five RBIs. It seems like he had been starting to get things working again near the end of this last series, and hopefully he can continue that momentum so that it's a different story the next time we put a recap out. But one of the silver linings has been Christian Walker. He has a 310 average in the last two weeks with 13 hits, two home runs, and five RBIs. So not all is lost. There's some guys that are bright spots for this team. But overall, we need to carry the momentum from the end of this Padres series. Like you were saying there, Tallman, Rockies are a good way to keep that momentum going. We could have a five-game winning streak by the end of this series. And then who knows? We just did well against the Padres, and maybe we can at least split that series with them. I think the goal right now is to continue to win as many games, put the pennant race out of your mind, and just focus on winning as many ball games so you can maybe capture that wild card spot. But guys, with all that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Mike first. I want you to share with us who your player of the recap is. The pitching struggles have been going on. We've known about this for a long time, but the bats have been really dormant over the past month and a half, it seems. But one guy who has really stood above the rest, it seems like, is all-star Lourdes Coriel Jr. Over the past two weeks, he's hitting 349 with 15 hits, four homers, seven RBIs, and six runs scored. He had his first pinch hit homer to lead us to that series victory against the San Diego Padres. And it seems like he's doing everything that he possibly can to keep momentum moving forward for this Diamondbacks club. After he himself struggled in July, kind of the same way that we're seeing with Corbin Carroll. But i got to give some love to my man, Lourdes Goriel Jr., and he definitely is my player of the recap for this one. So, Tallman, who do you got, man? Who's your player of the recap? So, yeah, I'm not really going to go with the player here. I'm going to go staff member of the recap. Is that allowed here, or is is that just a cheap way out? Who knows? But I'm going to give the nod 
this recap to Mike Hazen, just the aggressiveness with this roster. Let's talk about first with Carson Kelly, just ripping that Band-Aid right off, getting him out of here. I mean, he's been a liability for us. I, I'm sure it was hard for those guys in that office because he's that last piece that we have from that Paul Goldschmidt trade. But we all know Gabriel Moreno's the catcher. He's our starting catcher. He's our catcher of the future. We need to clear the way for him. So that was awesome to see that. And then I mentioned some names too, seeing McCarthy sent down, who has you know, been one of those consistent names in the rotation throughout the whole season. Them sending Ryan Nelson down. The only pitcher that hasn't missed a start other than Zach Allen this year was Ryan Nelson. So them sending him down, also getting out of uh, Manuel Rivera, that dude was 0-19. His last 19 at-bats, 0-19. So they're bringing back up Kyle Lewis, bringing up a guy by the name Buddy Kennedy. Don't know much about him, won't lie, but hey, it looks like he's been a little hot down there uh, in the AAA. Also, they're bringing up another young pitcher, this Bryce Jarvis guy, where originally I saw that he was going to fill in that rotation spot, but it's looking like he's going to be pitching out of the bullpen. So, But another young guy, another young pitcher. I mean, with Slade Coney, Brandon Fott, and now Jarvis, it's, you know, we're, we're really putting ourselves out there with this pitching. And I mentioned in a couple of recaps ago, or maybe the last one, I mean, this pitching is going to be the death of this team. Still thinking that. But hey, that aggressiveness, it's kind of like, you either shape up or you ship the hell out. And they're really living by that. So Mike Hazen, way to go. Keep it up. Not bad. Mike Hazen, Gurriel Jr., good choices. I don't know how well the Brandon Fott experiment is working out to this point. So I got to give Hazen a little bit of a ding there. But he's working with what he's got, even though it's his job to build the team. Regardless, great choice. My player of the recap this week is going to be Paul Seawald. I know, maybe a little bit controversial given how he's entered this team. He came in in a situation that wasn't a save and did pretty good. And then the next opportunity he got, his first save opportunity, he blew it. I think we'll just go ahead and call that one a mulligan. We'll throw it out. Because if that weren't the case, he'd still have five strikeouts, two saves in three appearances, and zero earned runs. So we'll give him the mulligan, and we'll give him the two saves that he's gotten for us so far. We clearly needed a solid closer, and it looks like now we have one. So as far as the back end of the bullpen goes, we're looking much better than we were in July and previously but you're right guys the starting pitching is going to continue to be under the microscope and hopefully they can carry the first half of the game so that we can get to our strong bullpen and maybe get Seawald some more saves so I'm gonna have to go with him but we got four more series coming up in the next two weeks we'll be looking to take on the Colorado Rockies in Colorado for a three-game series we'll then head to California to take on the San Diego Padres for a four-game series before we come back home for a two-game series against the Texas Rangers and a three-game series against the Cincinnati Reds. Maybe looking at some redemption there. Well, make sure you guys tune in and follow us on social media at AZ underscore VSP on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram, and Valley Sports Plug on YouTube and Facebook. For Michael Benjamin and VSP Tallman, I'm Chris Patrick, and we'll see you next time. Peace.